don't know. I think thanks for playing. I've heard that in a little different light than that. So yeah. thanks for playing. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see everybody here today. Is everybody liking this cooler weather? Yes. yes. Certainly is nice outside. Well, if you're watching online, please go ahead and give us a shout out. Say hi in the comments. Let us know that you are watching. Um, get started with some announcements this morning. We'll get through those so we can get to the best part of the service, which is worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll be watching the next episode of The Chosen from Season 2. Believe it or not, we have two episodes left. This will be season, or Episode 7 of Season 2. This past week, we actually did a double. We watched uh, 5 and 6. First season, we had the the clips, so we were kind of able to keep going along with us and seeing what was what was happening. But because we don't have those clips, and I actually reached out to the man or the company that created those, and they said they don't have any plans on doing any further seasons, and I was like sad. But um, so we're going to show the uh, episode on Wednesday, and then hear the message about the episode on Sunday, <coughs> so we get a little bit better context to that as you're listening on Sundays. Then we're gonna, we got a little bit of a break here. It's like we've got a few, like an extra week in September feels like. So not until October 7th at 9 a.m. will we have our next men's breakfast. So we invite you to join us for that, connecting with other brothers in Christ, having a great meal and a great conversation along with just some great fellowship. Then that evening, as I knock things around, we will be showing the next episode, so to speak, of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia franchise, which will be Prince Caspian. Now, if you've never seen this episode, go ahead and check it out in the, the playlist. If you're watching online, when you go to the playlist for the music, it'll be at the end of that, so check that out there. At the end of the service when we are not broadcasting it, so we don't get a strike on YouTube or Facebook or anything, we'll show the video to those of you that are here. Um, but it will be a great time. If you have want more information, go out to Grace Street Church. Click on the Grace Street Cinema link in the upper right-hand corner for more information, and the trailer is also there. Then, following week on October 14th, we will be having the next to the last race in our Orange Track Racing Season 18. I'm just trying to figure out how we've gotten this far, this quickly. Not just into October on the next to the last of the races, but 18 years. So. Uh, Great, great time. And then, as always, uh, we will be putting the link to the worship music into the uh, comments on the Facebook feed. If for some reason you don't get it, message us, let us know. We will send it to you in a private message so that you have that. Now it's time to calm our hearts, calm our minds, and prepare to hear the message that Mark has prepared for us this morning. The message that God has given him, found and forgiven. And this morning, our call to worship comes from Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. Hear the words of our Lord and Savior. He said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Now, Mark and I will adamantly and constantly tell you to read around these passages and this passage depending on your bible will have a different header but mine says jesus and zacchaeus and if, as, and if you're like me and you grew up in the church the first thing that's in your head is zacchaeus was a wee little man mm -hmm. now that's in your head so I'm, you're welcome this verse is at the end of the passage where Jesus and Zacchaeus have met. And Jesus, or Zacchaeus has just declared, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus' response before we get to verse 10 was, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Can you imagine the uproar of the people who did not want to hear this about a tax collector? They would not want to admit that Zacchaeus, like Matthew, 
who is also a son of Abraham. What that and the message today is going to teach us is that our past does not define who we are today and in the future. You see, it's through faith that we are forgiven and we are found and forgiven. As we hear the message this morning, many of you will be able to relate to times in your life where you stumbled and fell. Oops, an allusion to a song in the worship set. <laughs> but we all make mistakes. All of us, pastors included, none of us is immune to making a mistake. And in this episode, we saw Mary found and ultimately forgiven. And we are as well. Father God, we thank you that in your great grace and mercy and forgiveness that we are found and we are truly forgiven. We just need to reach out to you, admit our failure. You desire only that and you forgive us. Father, open our ears open our hearts and our minds to hear the message that you've given to Mark this morning so that we can truly grasp this concept that we are found and forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Awesome. Can we do better than that? Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, I like that one a lot better. So, this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We got a lot of things to be glad about. We look at that stuff we got going on in church in here. Uh, it's really a good time, I think. We have things that we can join together with to lift each other up, to edify each other. Edification means that we are going to, it's the process of taking someone who is down, lost, disparaged in their life, and it's lifting them up. It's giving them a hand up, not a hand out. See, anytime you give anybody a hand out, they're still in the same place that they were before, but if we give them a hand up and help them out, then we are lifting them out of that position, that circumstance that they're in in their life. And last, uh, my last message, I talked about being spiritually and physically lost. And today, I want to talk about feeling emotionally lost and lost in unity with God. Not being in the presence of God, not having God in our lives. And as we go through life, at times we feel as though we've lost that connection. We've lost our connection. We feel disconnected in life and questioning our self-worth. Ever been there? Oh man, everybody's got to be there at some point in time. Are you there now? That's a good question. Well, these are two very relevant questions that each of us has likely experienced at least once in their life. And for some, it may actually be daily as they go through their daily struggles. In the Bible, it was clear that we will not have an easy life. It said, hey, once you become a believer, it doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. No, no issues, no problems. In fact, it says exactly the opposite. We will be tested and we will be given trials to test our faith with God. If our reliance is on God, then we will pass that test. And God will see us through no matter what we're going through in our lives. So it's kind of nice and it's amazing to see that. Um, it's amazing to see how the stories in the Bible mirror the society that we live in today. I mean, look at all the stuff. I think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right now, we kind of seem to be in that situation, depending upon where we are in the world. But of course, as time goes by, the more cruel and evil things become in the world, it's an understatement to say that we as Christians would not be affected too. There's going to be days that you're going to feel lost, confused, empty. But see, we always need to remember one thing, and that is that we can lean on God's word to get us through. 
lean on our church family. That's why we come into communion together in here. So we can lean on each other to lift each other up out of that position that we're in. And to bring ourselves back into communion with each other and in God as that happens. Because as we lift each other up and as we come into communion together, then we bring God in in the process. And so we restore that balance back into our lives. There's a lot of people that go through lives on a regular basis and their lives are completely out of balance. And they don't do anything about it because they think they're, that's their lot in life, you know. They've resigned themselves to the fact that this is all it's going to be. This is as good as it gets. I heard that the other day, you know. There's a lot of people who are out there saying, hey, this is as good as it gets. But they're missing out on what God had planned for them. So I have a question for everybody today, and it's going to be a rhetorical question, so unless you feel called to yell it out, go ahead. Why did Jesus come to earth? Anybody else? Think about it. Well, it wasn't to be in the company of righteous Christians. It was actually to come to save the fallen, to follow those people who are lost in their lives and bring them back to God. Bring them back to himself as the Son of God. And that's what he did. If you notice, he didn't go around to all the high priests and the prophets of the day and everything like that. He didn't go to see them. He went to see the people who were lost. He sought the lost so that they could be found. They could be forgiven and that they could be brought back into a right relationship with God. And even though this happened a long, long time ago, I want you to know today that nothing has changed. Jesus is the same as he was then. He will still find us and save us when we are lost. And we need to find comfort in that. We need to find comfort knowing that if we're lost at that point in time and we're feeling really down and low and we're at the bottom, we think we're at the pit, what we have to understand is Jesus is there. We just got to call out to him. And that should make you feel a whole lot better that you have Jesus in your presence at that point in time to bring you through the situation that you're in. See, it won't mean that we won't go into the situation, but he will bring us through it. And usually he will bring us through it much better than what we were before. See, we need to remember that when Jesus came to earth, he came as a human. He was human too. He knows our troubles. He went through them himself. He lived the life out here. He saw the wickedness of the world in his own eyes. So we have to understand he's got a one-on-one -on -one relationship with us because of that. He felt the evil that was taken over the hearts of, of men in the day. Men and women, I use that men as a you know, generalization. So as a result, you can be assured that God understands what you're feeling. God understands the trials that you're going through in your life. However, for God to help you, you have to cry out to him. When we're in the depths of our situation, we need to cry out to God. We need to pray. That's how we cry out to him. We need to ask for his grace, and he will relieve you from his pain. From that pain, from that situation you're going through, we have to ask for him to help get us out of it. He will give us that hand up to bring us through that situation. And we, a lot of times, want to depend on part ourselves. And we want to depend on our own understanding. And we, I can get me out of this thing, and then you start scheming on different ways to get you out of it. And it usually ends up getting you worse than what you were to begin with. But if we turn to God first and ask him for help, his word tells us, promises, gives us an assurance in writing, in the Bible. It tells us that he will bring us through that and he will give us that help that we're calling for. And it's one thing, you know, to feel lost in our lives and to, to wander away from God. It happens to everybody at some point in time. And we need to understand that uh, being lost and wandering away from God can be the result of feeling lost in life. We just kind of give up on life. We give up on everything. But before we wander away too far, all we need to do is pray, and God will send people into your path, into your life, to help bring you back into the fold, take you from being lost, and bring you back into being found. But we can't be complacent about it. We can't just go, yeah, 
nothing's going to happen. This is as good as it gets. Because when we resign ourselves to that fact, when we resign ourselves to there's nothing more that I can do, well, you're probably right. Because you're not calling upon God. There's always things you can do with God. Feeling lost can make you think of all kinds of plenty of wrong things at the same time. You get those mind games playing between the ears in here. And sometimes we're our worst enemy, own worst enemy when it comes to that. Because we can convince ourselves of just about anything if you listen to the mind games that goes on in your head. Things like, you really didn't deserve God's grace anyway. So, the Lord's given up on you. He's tired of you. Because you come to him and you go right back to the same place. But see, there's no truth in any of that. God is patient. His love is patient. He doesn't judge you based on your faults. If you're lost, he will find you because he loves you. He has unending love for you. And when you're feeling sad and everything, your heart gets very heavy. When this heaviness takes over that heart, that's when you feel lost. When you feel the worst and the furthest away from God is when you have that heaviness, that anxiety that takes over your life. Being lost leads to anxiety and you have no clue what to do with your life anymore. Sounds like a bad place. It's not some place you want to stay for very long. I know I wouldn't. That's why we need to turn to, back to God's Word. We got a whole case full of free Bibles over there if anybody needs one. That's what they're here for. Isaiah 41.10 In there God made it clear that you must not be afraid and dismayed before. He will give you the strength. And he will help you. And in 41.10 it says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. So what he's saying is, what? Don't depend upon yourself. What do you keep seeing in there? Four different times. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Best of all, he's going to hold us up whenever we're down. The Lord is our shepherd, that shepherd that will go after those lost sheep. That's his job. That's what he's done. We must know that he's going to find us even if we wander away, even when we feel lost, even if we don't go to God's word in the scriptures. We would miss out on all those promises that he has, those assurances that he has, his blessings that he has for us in the word. That's why we need to go there. See, if we don't have all those blessings, if we don't have those promises, if we don't have those assurances, guess what? We're destined to feel lost the whole time. We're going to remain feeling lost. And God doesn't find pleasure in just saving a few souls. He wants everyone. So in this section of the chosen that we're looking in here, who is he going to? Jesus is out there. He's going to the Gentiles, not the Jews. He wants to include everyone. Everyone is welcome to him. And that's what he wants everyone to understand. He wants to save us all because that's how much he loves us. So don't think for a second that you don't matter because you do. You matter to God. You matter to your church family. And I love our, our prayer chain and things like that. When anyone has an issue, the prayers come flowing in. You get lifted up by the other people because they're going through stuff too. And that's how we help each other out as we lift each other up out of that situation. Lord, The Lord is going to find you. He will not grow tired in doing that again and again and again. And he will put those people in your path to help you up, to edify you. There's always going to be days when you feel lost, and some days you're going to feel lost more than others. The best way to protect yourself from those negative feelings that comes in is to always have the Holy Spirit in your heart. Start your day off first thing before the feet hit the floor at your knees. Go to God in prayer and say, God, go before me in all that I do in this day. Help me through and make sure that I bring glory to you in all that I say and all that I do. That's what I say every day. And then I hit the floor. And then I start feeling lost. <laughs> so we have to go to God first. We have to have the Holy Spirit in our heart. We need to start our day with God and end our day with God. 
and then he'll be through the whole day with us. When there's days where you don't know how to get home, and it says, you know, your, your, your mind is going back and forth and back and forth, going, geez, I just don't know what to do next. I'm out of options. I'm out of options. There's days when that happens again and again. Well, the best thing you can do is to seek God and let him guide you. Remember, there's no place too far away for God to, to find us and reach out to us, to bring us back to him. We, we noticed that they're learning these verses in here in, in the Chosen. And one of the verses that we talked about last week that Pastor Terry brought forth, what's it say? If I go to the heavens, you are there. And if I go to the deepest depths of the ocean, you are there. So no matter where we are in our life, if we're in a high spot in our life, God is with us. And if we're at the lowest spot we can get into, God is with us. He's with us always. And he's always going to bring us back home to you. So there's no two places too far away for God to find us and reach us. Last week we saw where Mary was feeling lost. And she was feeling disconnected. And so she didn't feel like she belonged any longer in the and so she left suddenly. And so they had to send others to find her. And see, we have to understand, you know, we should be able to relate to that very well. Because there's often times in our life that we have feelings of being disconnected. Feelings of not being worthy of God. Questioning why God would want us at all. I've been there. I can't say it only happened once. It's happened many times. But you could see, we can never be worthy enough for God, and that's the point. We will never be worthy without God. That's the point. And a lot of times we just miss the point in life. So in this episode that we saw on Wednesday night, uh, we resume where Jesus sent Matthew and Simon Peter to find Mary. And they searched without success and had spent the night in a stable together. Now, as we remember from the very beginning, and if you guys haven't checked in on that, you guys really need to watch The Chosen. But that's my sister, so I can say things like that to her. They're visiting from Illinois. But we see where Simon Peter was an absolute enemy of Matthew. And he, you know, he told him, for what you did to our people, for betraying our people, for turning your back on our people, for making yourself rich on the backs of our people. I will never forgive you. So Jesus sent Matthew and Simon Peter together, the tax collector, with Simon Peter, to go find Mary. And meanwhile, while that was happening, we see that Mary had slid back into her old ways until she was sitting there and she remembered being saved from that very lifestyle. And Matthew and Simon find her, and being brothers in Christ, they consoled her and lift her up out of her mindset to bring her back into the fold. Jesus sent people to bring her back, to let her know that she was still wanted, that she was still useful in the ministry. Mary had shame and remorse and feeling less than worthy, but through the words that Matthew and Simon had said, she could see that she meant more to others than what she even realized. And it took Matthew and Simon working together to point it out to her. To give her that reassurance that she really meant more than what she could see of herself. And isn't that where we are a lot in our lives? So many times in our lives, we, we can't see our own self-worth. We can't see the effect that we have on others. And we end up feeling less about ourselves because of it. But others can see that goodness in us. Others can see that they depend on us for things that we fail to see ourselves. So in the process, it was a learning experience for Simon. He saw a different side of Matthew. Instead of seeing that tax collector that he hated, he saw compassion. He saw support. And instead of judging him for his past, he saw the change in Matthew's life. See, because when Jesus called Matthew to become a disciple, to follow Jesus, to be a student, to learn, to learn 
what it meant to have a godly life. It changed Matthew's life. He was no longer that tax collector. He walked away from wealth. He walked away from a, a perfect lifestyle that he could do pretty much anything he wanted. He was protected by the Romans. But see, that wasn't life. He was just going through the motions. And he got back to who he needed to be, back to who God had created him to be. And see, that could be our story as well. It may be a chapter that you're in right now in your life. And as I said before, I know because I've been there more than once in my life. And see, that's okay. That's okay to be there. It's okay to be in that chapter of your life. See, those challenges, those things, those trials, those circumstances that we're in, they're learning experiences for us. They learn. We learn from those. They teach us what not to do to get back into those places. It's kind of like Mary. She had that epiphany. She woke up in that bar where she was gambling. And she went, oh, be Satan from this life. And she got up, walked away from the whole bag of money left on the table. And then she went up to try and calm her sorrows, so to speak. See, if we learn from them, they become an opportunity for us to grow. And as a result, we will grow to be different. We will grow to be changed. We will grow to be renewed. If we learn from those circumstances, from those experiences, from those backslides that we have in life. And yes, when we come back to Jesus in our humanness, we're going to feel shame. We're going to feel remorse. And that's fine. That's okay. You have to understand it's okay to have those emotions. Because, see, these emotions are indicative of our moral compass being put back on track to where it should be. So if we don't feel those things, we learn nothing from that backslide. We learn nothing from being pulled out. So those moral compass being pointed back in the correct direction, those emotions that we feel, those are good things. And instead of being judged harshly, harshly for our weaknesses, we're welcomed back into the presence of God. And we hear Jesus say, hey, look up. I forgive you. It's over. You're done with that. And what he means by that is don't dwell on the past. Don't live in the past. The reason it's called the past is because it is in the past. Leave the past behind. There's nothing you can do to go back and change what's already done. That's why it's called the past. It's behind us. Leave it there. Do you remember a time in your life when Jesus uttered those words to you? I forgive you. It's over. How has the forgiveness of Jesus changed your life? How has it made you different? Something to think about. When we're lost and then found and forgiven, it will be life-changing. You couldn't be possibly be the same again because you're renewed by the Spirit of God. Now I want you to understand that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfected. We're not going to have a perfect life, never to sin again, but it is a learning experience. And God will pull us through it and make us better in the process, a better person. It's our opportunity to move on in life, improve past our past situations that we have. But again, we have to do our part. We have to repent from our heart, not just from our lips. That's really, really important. Your heart is your holy of holies, and we have to repent from our heart, not just from our lips. We commit to changing our life to mimic what God has planned for our life. And step up and step out of the things that brought us down to begin with. We have to take that first step. It's up to us to do it. We have to reach our hand out for God. That's that first step. We have to want to leave that past, that circumstance. Being down, we have to want that new life. He can't just hand it out to us. He'll give us that hand up to pull us out of it. And that may mean new friends, a change of a living space for those who are in a bad situation or have negative influences around them. It may mean getting out of a bad relationship. It might mean a change in employment. By its very nature, it leads us to a fresh start, and that leads us then for the opportunity to have a new future. 
a new future. We can't backslide into what got us down in the first place and expect anything to change. We have to change for the positive. We have to step up. It's on us. The only person who can change your life is you. Period. So let's face it. Very few of us are living out the life that we envisioned when we left high school, right? Anybody here living it out? Not so much. Yeah. So what happened then in our lives? We had this vision of what we were going to do when we were in high school, right? But something happened. And we changed. And we moved on. And we are living a different life. And the key is what we have to do just that. We have to change and then move on. After all, it might be the life that you really wanted to start with. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. I'm going to say that again. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. We have to make that change ourselves. We have to take that first step to step out of that circumstance that we are in. Bring God in with us. Another thought on being lost and found is when we stray away from God, who God intended us to be. If we don't take that step, we can't get to what God wanted us to be in our lives. And in doing so, we become someone who others judge us to be, less than what society says is acceptable. In The Chosen, we see examples of this in the, in the leper who was healed. The lepers were the outcasts, and any time anyone came within six meters of them, they had to scream out, raise their hands up, and say, unclean, unclean, so no one would come near them. And they were made to feel less than human. We see it in Jesse at the pool. Jesse was crippled for 38 years, and he'd been laying by the side of a pool waiting for someone to help him get into that pool so he could get healed by those bubbling waters that came up. But it was a pipe dream. He never got healed. He felt less than human. He was abandoned by society. Society saw them as being less than acceptable. And we had the man who was possessed that Jesus healed. He was possessed with seven different demons inside of him. And he knew his demon lineage and he spoke it back out to them and told them exactly who he was as a demon. But see, that wasn't the life that God had created him to be. So Jesus healed him from that. And his life was changed forever. Then we see Mary. Mary was an outcast in society. We see the woman at the well. The woman at the well had been married five times. She had five different husbands. And the man that she was living with was not her husband. But Jesus called her out of that and gave her a different future. And her life was changed forever. See, this is how they were deemed by society, but Jesus loved them in spite of their condition, in spite of how society viewed them. He saw their humanness. He saw who God created them to be, and he restored them to who they were meant to be, who God created them to be. Moreover, he restored their dignity, their very place in society, once was lost, was now found. So let's take a look at the disciples themselves, his students and his followers that were with him each and every day. Well, we had a gambler and a schemer. That's Simon Peter. We had a tax collector who was getting rich off the backs of his own people. We had a highly trained assassin. All disciples, all changed lives all called out of that situation, that life that they were living into a better situation. We had a woman of ill repute, and he took them out of their current circumstances, and he showed them that they had a higher purpose, a higher calling, and they had more self-worth than what society had cast upon them. Jesus took them from being lost and restored them to doing good works and great things in the process. They became living examples of renewal, restoration, rebirth, reconciliation. He brought them back from that pit that they were in and gave them a new future, gave them a new life. 
And see, those people, those people in society who knew them before came to see them differently, changed, set apart. They were no longer judged by their past, and instead their past became the example of how much they had changed, how far they had actually come. Just as the disciples had stumbled and fell back in some of their old habits, those preconceived notions that they had, he continued to do a work in them and through them to change them and many others in the process. And see, that's where we are in our life too. Despite all the preconceived notions, despite all of the rest of the things, Jesus wants to bring renewal. He wants to bring re restoration, rebirth, reconciliation to God. Bring us back in to communion with him. He wants that renewal for us today. All we need to do is accept the forgiveness and have faith in who he is and what he's done. See, we're all a work in progress. They were all a work in progress as well. All they had to do is say yes to Jesus. All we have to do is say yes. If we remember back to Jesse, Jesus came and he said to him, do you want to be healed? And what did Jesse do? He gave him every reason why he couldn't be healed. So Jesus had to ask him again, do you want to be healed? When he said yes, he was healed. And he picked up his mat and walked for the first time in 38 years. See, and that's us today. All we have to do is say yes. And if not today, then when? The choice is yours alone. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you be before you today with a humbleness of heart. And we've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God. But you assure us that that is not where we have to stay, lost in a lost world. So we thank you today, God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your unending love and your forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you. Help us to be strong in our faith. Help us to keep from falling and bring glory to you. Restore us. Reconcile us. <clears throat> sequence today, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. In my reading this morning as I have when I got up, Let me preface this with, when I teach at work, I talk, we troubleshoot, and I talk about starting off in a fun, like a funnel. You start off with the big open-ended questions, and you work your way down to the yes-no questions. And God said, look at my scriptures this way. When I created the world, I created it for everyone. But then that got messed up at the fall, so I chose Israel. And they couldn't keep my laws, so I went down and I chose the one person who could keep the commandments. And then from there, he had come for the Israelites. But at his death, everything came back to being for everyone again. It was like a reverse. It's just, I'm thinking like an uh, hourglass, yeah. Where it starts full for everyone and ends full for everyone. So as we take and celebrate this meal together today, let us be remembered that this was for all of us. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And later in the meal when he took the cup, so this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you, found, forgiven. Scripture tells us as often as we do this, we have to do this until the Lord returns. Each day, many of us say, come Lord Jesus, come, we're ready for his return now, but in God's great 
patience. He waits. body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that each time we take this bread and drink this cup, that we do so until your son returns again. And while we do want Jesus' return to be hastened, we know that you are a patient God, a God full of grace, of mercy, of love, and forgiveness, a God who will not have his son return until the last person has repented. We thank you that you are patient because that meant that we were able to be found and we were able to be forgiven. In Jesus' name. to pray for them this morning or have you know somebody? I kind of went off the prayer chain this morning and I'm going to pray for all those on the prayer chain. Yes. Gwen's sister passed away yesterday. Gwen's sister? Oh goodness. Okay. That was Judy. Judy. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else? All right. Oh. We come to you this morning, giving honor and praise to the Most High God. Your power stretches throughout the universe. Your kingdom no one can fathom. Yet your love, your mercies, and your grace are new to us each and every day. Help us all to stay in your word and to renew our minds. Forgive us of our sins and wash us clean. Let our conscience be our guide to keep us in your will and not our own. In Colossians 3, 12, 14, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Father God, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts. Um, we lift up Harold Hickson to you, Lord Jesus. May your Holy Spirit rest upon him and comfort him through this time. Be with his family in the days ahead and just um, comfort them, Lord God, and bring him into your home. And we, um, we um, pray for Gwen's sister, Gwen and her sister's family for they lost Judy this weekend. We just pray for them, Father God. Comfort them and be let them be your let you be their guide, Lord Jesus, and be with them always. I lift up Amanda and Kelly to you, Father God. Give them courage and strength in each new day. We ask for their healing of their kidneys, Lord Jesus. Be with them and guide them through this trial they are facing. For you are the great physician. And through you, all things are possible, Lord Jesus. Father God, I lift up Nick to you. You alone were with him when you created him in his mother's womb. You created his inmost being. You alone can heal him. We ask if you are willing that this will be done in Jesus' name. We ask for protection over Nick, Doug, and Don as they face the elements each day and night. Give them shelter, food, and loving care. Guide them in your ways, O oh Lord. Please give Carla and Bill and all my family safe travels from the wedding they went to in Georgia this weekend. And we cover Mark with the blood of Jesus. Watch over Bill Funky, a Father God, as he goes through chemo. Give him strength and courage to face each new day. Give him endurance to fight this battle of leukemia. Strengthen his body as only you can. Help him to know he is loved by you. 
I also pray for continued healing for Joe and his knees. Since he will be having surgery again in October, we just pray your healing power over Joe, Lord God. Comfort him each day. Lastly, I ask for prayers from all of you this week, as I will be having rotator cuff surgery in my right arm this week. And I ask, Lord, that you will give me, you will heal me and bring me the Holy Spirit in the surgery room, that the doctor will fix it correctly and no infection will occur, that I will be healed quickly, Lord God. Walk with me through this fire, Lord Jesus. Comfort and sustain me as only you can. We ask you to deliver us daily from the evil forces of this world. Help us to show compassion and love to those in need. And in Colossians 3:17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. amen. This brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today. And as I was picking out the music uh, that we're going to be listening to, uh, I went through about 10 different songs and I kept getting pulled back and pulled back and pulled back that someone needs to hear these songs today. It could be me. Who knows? Yeah. It was nice to have. This is Bill, by the way, that we're praying for. Oh, goodness. This is my yes. brother in law, Bill. So yes. it's very yeah, nice that we could have him here with us today so that he receive those prayers upon him here in person. So dear Lord, we just uh, do our very best each and every day to affirm one another and to remove those barriers that seem to hinder our relationships and keep us at a distance from one another. Lord, please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits, and help us to let go of grudges that we may hold on to so tightly. Inspire us, dear God, to be regifters of your grace your mercy, your blessings, and your love. And Lord, lead us to be vessels, ambassadors of your forgiveness, of your healing love, and of your wisdom. Loving and gracious God, pour your spirit upon us today that we will have courage to reach out to those who have offended or hurt us in our lives so that we might forgive them as you have forgiven us. With your inspiration, Heavenly Father, may our efforts to heal the wounds that hurt our families, hurt our churches, hurt our world, Lord, let's let go of those things and join together in these times. Lord, lead our hearts to worship you more fully each and every day. Bless us, dear God, that we might have hearts full of your grace, full of your peace, and full of your mercy, and go before us in anything that we say or do. May we strive to be reconciled to you and to one another. Help us to always to remember to live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he, for, when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.